so glad that you could join us this evening for our Q&A session with New York Times bestselling author Alex Kershaw. Um, his book, The Liberator, was turned into a miniseries that recently premiered on Netflix last month. Yes, um, Alex was connected to Reedus University uh, Center for the Study of War Experience um, during that research, and that's why we're here tonight. So before we dive in with Alex, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rose Campbell, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of War Experience. I'll be moderating this evening the Q&A, um, and I want to quickly thank um, the alumni office here at Regis for making this event happen. I worked closely with Amber O'Connell in particular, and I want to give her a really big thank you for all of her support. I wish we could give her a round of applause, but in the age of COVID, <laughs> a silent round of applause. So thank you so much, Amber. Um, Amber and I are actually both Regis alumni, so it was really fun to get to know her and work on this event. So I look forward to partnering with the alumni office for future events. Um, also, I have some reminders and, and, an, and one announcement, actually. So um, our big reminder of the night is please stay on mute. Um, that way um, we, can, we can maintain the sound quality and since this is a Q&A, um, you'll see down on your screen, there's a chat feature. And so if you have a question for Alex, um, go ahead and use that chat feature. So type it in so there's no need to go off mute and ask. Um, Amber and I will both be um, keeping track of the questions. I'm going to be, um, I have a document where I'll track all the questions and I'll ask them when it seems like the appropriate time. So just go ahead and, and submit your questions that way. Um, we'll hopefully get to all the questions. Um, and then I actually have one, one announcement here and it's a little bit of a surprise for you all, but I wanted to let everyone know that um, everyone who's currently on this Zoom call um, has been automatically entered into a drawing for a signed copy of the Liberator, which Alex is gracious graciously agreed to do for us. So um, the folks over in the alumni office will choose a winner randomly, I think by a number in which you registered or signed in, and um, they will be in touch with whoever gets chosen. So that should come in a couple weeks um, with COVID and the holidays and the books are still in transit. Um, so yeah, that was our just surprise giveaway for this evening. Uh, let's see. So one more thing before we get started with Alex, um, I wanted to briefly introduce the new director of our center, Dr. Lauren Hirschberg. She joined us earlier this year and she is currently, or she is an assistant professor of history in the Department of History, Politics and Political Economy here at Regis. It's kind of a mouthful. I'm still getting used to saying that, uh, but we are so happy to have her join our team. And I'm going to go ahead, Lauren, if you're ready, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and she's gonna share our plans for stories from wartime next next spring, which is actually our 26th year. So it's been going on for uh, almost three decades here at Regis. And since I do see some people who I've, I don't, I'm not familiar with your names, um, I wanted to let you know that Stories from Wartime, it's a popular undergraduate course here at Regis and it's open to the public and the topic changes each year. So with that, um, Lauren, you wanna take it over? Sure, sure. And I'll just keep this brief because um, I don't want to cut into our time. But just first of all, I'm so delighted to see you all here. I'm very delighted to um, to be the new director of the center and building off of all the wonder wor wonderful work that Dan Clayton has done over the years and Rose as well. And um, we're very excited that we have a really special theme for Stories for More Time for the spring that Rose and I are going to teach together which centers around or kind of came out of the idea from one of our uh, beloved Regis alumni, Walter Springs, who was an African-American student at Regis and who um, uh, went off to uh, officer training in 1942 um, and, had, and was murdered while he was um, in training. And so we're using the course to actually dig into the history of his life and his story by giving a broader context over the 15 weeks of African-American experiences of war. Um, so it's really gonna center around citizenship and service and really thinking about sort of a long durée of African-American history and wartime service. Um, so we're really excited. We're still developing the syllabus, but we will have that up on our um, on our uh, stories or on our center for the study of war experience website soon, so that you can hopefully join us for some, if not all, of those classes um, and get to learn a little bit about more about Walter and the broader history. So really delighted. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, as Lauren said, just keep an eye on our website, and by early January, we should we will have the topics posted and the ways that you can access 
um, the, the course online. So um, now it's time to dive into what you all came for. And just a reminder before we get going, um, go ahead and put yourself on mute for us. Thanks. And I did get a message from our one of our Marcom um, folks at Regis here, and she reminded me that the, the most recent Regis magazine has a story about Walter um, that Lauren was just speaking about. So if you want to get your hands on a copy of that, you can read a little bit more in depth about his story. It's really sad and also important. Uh, great. So um, here we go. We're going to dive into what you came for tonight with uh, Alex Kershaw. Welcome, Alex. Hello. Um, hi there. Hi. So Alex is a widely acclaimed and award-winning author of several New York Times best-selling books about World War II, um, including The Bedford Boys, The Longest Winter, The Few, Escape from the Deep, The Liberator, of course, and Avenue of Spies. Um, so his, his 2012 book, The Liberator, follows the journey of Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks and the 157th Infantry Regiment through 500 days of combat in Italy, France, and the liberation of Dachau. Um, in the as, as I mentioned before, in the research and writing of the book, Alex uh, was connected with Dr. Dan Clayton, who was the founder of the Center for the Study of War Experience. Um, and he's, he's actually on vacation right now. So he's not, he didn't, he didn't join us this evening. He's a lucky guy. He's at a hunting lodge somewhere in the mountains. So, um, but Dr. Clayton and Alex created a beautiful relationship. Um, and that's how Alex got involved here at Regis. Um, and let's see, also last event we had was with Dr. Clayton. He shared his experiences um, getting to know and interviewing um, Felix Sparks. So, so for those of you who missed that, we do have a recording and we can get that to you if you just email us. Um, and it was a great conversation. We're so glad Dan could do that with us. Um, all right. So with that, um, again, just submit your questions on the chat feature and I'll keep my eye on that. And let's turn to you, Alex. Um, so I can only really imagine how exciting it has been to see your book turned into a Netflix series, especially with, with how much you care about Sparks as a person um, and the other men he fought with who appear in your book that you interviewed or got to know their families. Um, I'm wondering what has this last month been like for you to see that story on the screen for so many people to see? Um, well, it's kind of faded a little bit now because it, it came out on the 11th of November. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, it was very exciting because I thought, oh, my God, this is going to change my life, you know, and it didn't really change my life at all. But it was really it was really fantastic to watch. I, uh, Netflix didn't consult me at all. I was a producer, but I I didn't I wasn't uh, involved in any way in the production of the actual, you know, Netflix series. So I didn't see it till other people saw it. I, I literally I woke up on the 11th of November when they released it. <clears throat> And I'd never seen it before, so I watched it all morning, you know, it's four hours, and um, I cried an awful lot. I couldn't stop crying for some, I think lots of different reasons, you know, um, and I was very moved, and I, uh, every now and again, I'd be like, oh my God, they took that from my book. Oh my God, that, those two old guys, there's a picture in my book of those two old guys. So there were, it was, you know what's great is that um, Netflix, Netflix has almost 200 million global subscribers. So for about a week, it was trending in the top 10 in over 20 countries. So that's a lot of people around the world getting to know Felix Sparks, getting to know about the Thunderbirds. And a lot of them are really young, you know, they're teenagers and a lot of millennials, a lot of people in their 20s that wouldn't normally watch this kind of material. You know, it's animated, it's very new, it's kind of edgy, the technology. So it was just great to great to to reach a new audience too, you know. But yeah, it was it was fun. It was really fun. It was great. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that you weren't involved in the production. I thought I was going to ask you some questions about what that was like. Um that surprised me. So you you watched it the same day I did. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, definitely, yeah. So I was, I was very excited because I didn't know what the hell they'd done. You know, it could have been a complete disaster. I mean, I, I loved it. It was great, but there was a lot of anxiety mixed in with the anticipation. You know, I was like, oh my God, what are, will those guys at Regis ever talk to me again? Will Dan Clayton, will he shoot me? You know, so I don't think that's going to happen. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I think we all enjoyed it, definitely. At <laughs> least. Actually, that, goes, that brings us to our first question that was actually going to be my second from Eric Steinmate. So thanks, Eric. It, what, um, it, what was behind the decision to turn the story of Felix Sparks into a series? 
and then go with the animation process instead of that live action film. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, live action is very expensive. You know, I think that, I don't know how much they spent on this, but it was a lot less than they would have spent if it had it been live action. Um, it's at least a quarter less expensive um, because you don't have to have massive battle scenes. You don't have to try and find 10 tanks and um, it's just very, very expensive to make those kind of movies now. Um, and, you know, also you can't find 50 Panzer tanks. There aren't 50 Panzer tanks. So if you animate that, uh, you can actually have this really kind of epic feel to the narrative. Um, so even if you look at, even if you look at movies like Saving Private Ryan, um, a lot of recent big World War II movies, they'll have a few set pieces, you know, they'll have a few set pieces, maybe one, Saving Private Ryan famously at the beginning, the first 20 minutes where they put a lot of money into making it feel really big, but in fact, it's not that big. Um, those people who can remember the Battle of Britain movie in 1969. I was born just three years before that came out. So I, I remember watching it later. But the point is that that movie has such a massive, enormous budget because they had to go and find dozens of World War II planes. So point being is that with uh, Trioscope, the technology that they have, it's uh, they take put people on a stage and, it, and put a green screen behind them. And their actors actually act as if they're in the living room with you. They're, they're in a small confined studio and their facial features show. And then what happens is that everything behind them is animated, is colored in, is, is done by artists. And actually the actors, amazingly, they wear a special kind of makeup so that when they put this all together, it looks seamless. So they actually, it actually, actually looks like their faces have been painted too. So yeah, I thought it was a really, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people were thinking how the hell, what, what the hell is this going to look like? You know, kind of live action, stroke, animation. So I think it looked great. It was fantastic. It looked really was, good. Yeah, I was curious how you felt um, with it being animated. Do you think it was, yeah, overall, you think it worked? Yeah, no, and uh, also, you know, when I, the reason why I got into World War II um, when I was a kid was because I couldn't stop reading comics. Um, you know, I just I was addicted to World War II comics. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I was. And that really sparked my interest in, in the narratives of World War II and how they're told, uh, visual storytelling. And, you know, I, was, I, I just found them so um, engrossing that I think when I became a journalist and then I actually got to, in my 20s, start interviewing World War II veterans, I was like, oh my God, these are people that have just jumped out of a comic. They're real, but they're real. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not made up heroes. So it's, the irony is that finally, after writing 10 books and nine of them, sorry, eight were optioned by Hollywood. So the last 25 years I've been thinking, will you just goddamn make, sorry, will you just make one of these things? I've had eight options and that, that's, that was a, that was a, anyway. Um, so actually, when they actually made it for it to be end up being a cartoon or a comic, so to speak, animated, it was kind of ironic because that's where I that's where I started way way back way back, you know. It was pretty fascinating that you started like with your roots, going back to where you you began your interest in the subject. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like I was like nine or ten years old, and I I, I was really bored at my grandparents' house one summer, and um, I found a whole bunch of comics in the back in a shed in the backyard. And uh, so, so I was really, really bored. I thought, okay, I'll give them a go, you know? And my mum told me that she saw me one day walking along the street and she was worried that I'd walk into a lamppost because my head was buried in one of these, one of these comics. <laughs> well, you can- <laughs> Now she's going to leave, uh, leave to your long career. <laughs> and now she's worried that I'm gonna bump into a, a lamppost for lots of different re other, other, other reasons, but not because I've got my head in the comic. Yeah, yeah. I read they actually have the animation and it's the comic book style, but it is attracting a lot of younger people that normally maybe wouldn't reach out for this um, kind of content. So it's pretty neat. Um, and yeah, so I want to go to our um, next question um, from Jennifer. She said, or she's asking, how faithful the history was the movie or the series, and especially the sequence of events that dock out in the subsequent court martial. Um, actually, Sparks' story it's pretty faithful. I mean, there's some. Um dramatization, there's some things that didn't actually happen in World War II. Uh, but the sequence at Dachau is remarkably accurate. 
Um, it's pretty much how it is in my book. And I think that one of the things that I really loved about it is that, um, you know, the very scene at the end when I'm giving it away now, if you haven't watched it, you, you know, sorry, but I'm going to give you the, the ending now. Sparks comes back, he survives, and he, all the way through the narrative, he writes letters home to Mary. Uh, Jeff Stewart, who created the show and wrote the show, um, he said that he used those letters. He, they're all made up. None of them are actually uh, come out of my book at all. But it's a very nice voice. You get Sparks' voice developed by that technique. And it also connects him to Mary, his wife, who I met and interviewed at great length after Sparks died. So cut a long story short, I asked Mary, I said, you know, you hadn't seen Felix since um, for two years and you had a, a two-year-old son that, he, that had never seen Felix either. And I said, you must have been really, really kind of worried and nervous and excited. How did it feel to, to know that he was alive and he was coming home? And she told me that he called her from New York and said, I've been um, stationed in El Paso. And he said, come drive to El Paso. She was in uh, Arizona. And uh, so she drove to El Paso. And it, actually, they were uh, celebrating VE Day. Uh, sorry, VJ Day, uh, and she said, I got a room in a motel in El Paso, it was on the 10th floor or whatever, and I, I sat there alone and I could, I opened the window and I could hear these massive celebrations outside, it was the end of the war, and I was there on my own yet again on this very special evening, and then Sparks arrived the next day, and I said to her, well, what did he say when he saw you? And uh, she said, he, we didn't say anything, we just hugged for a long time. And if you watch the Liberator, that exact sequence of him coming across America in a train, her arriving, her being in El Paso, he goes up to the hotel room, opens the door, and then finally you just see them hug. That's exactly how Mary told me it was. So for me to see that after four hours of watching this narrative, to actually see that faithfulness to what Mary had actually told me was, was, was really lovely. I did cry a lot of that. I thought that was really powerful. And I was, you know, a lot of it was, sometimes there were times when I thought like, I didn't know that, I didn't know that I, I told that that well. I'm not being arrogant, but I just thought, wow, that really paid off in the book, in the show. Uh, Cause I agonized over lots of decisions about what to put in and what not to put into the book. So Jeff Stewart amplified some of my decisions and I was like, wow, that actually kind of worked, you know? Um, not that I needed him to validate it, but when you see it on a screen, you can see whether a story point works, whether a narrative is working. And um, there were lots of times when I thought, wow, that, that, was, that was great. That was good. Yeah. And OK. Yeah. So I was just going to ask more and um, specifically about that dock housing, because I was actually really waiting around for that. Like, how are they going to show it? And is it going to be true to the events? And because it's so complicated and it's so it's all yeah. the brain area of war, right? It's all. Yeah. Yeah, so I was curious how you felt, and that you know, going back to Jennifer's question about that scene in particular, and then his scene with General Patton at the end—that's that culminating scene. Um, <laughs> so yeah, tell me, tell us about that. How, how faithful do you think those scenes were to the, the actual history as you know it and as you wrote about it? Well, you know, in the book, they—they uh, they couldn't. You know, about a quarter of my book is just that one day on the 29th of April, 1945, in Dachau, and it's probably the strongest part of the book because I spent an awful lot of time researching it, the multiple points of view. Um, I try and create a sense of, of um, surreal craziness that so through, through looking at the events from the point of view of Sparks and his men and the inmates and the SS, etc. I try and create this very complex, very confusing, but very powerful sense of chaos and moral alarm. Um, so yeah, I think that in the you know in the the Netflix show they they basically showed the essential elements that were true they you know they, the Thunderbirds came across the death train that's well portrayed you see Sparks' reaction you see Lieutenant Walsh who actually committed the um, atrocity there that, that ordered men to shoot some of the SS um, actually Karl Mann who was Sparks' translator he was German born. And he spent six months with Sparks in the back of a bouncing Jeep. Karl Mann's still alive today, and he's actually in some of those scenes at Dachau. And he, and he said they were 
accurate. I saw a, a Facebook post from his son recently where you know he's he asked his dad, he was actually there, did it really happen like that, Dad? I mean, you were Sparks' translator, you're right by his side. He said, Yeah, it was pretty, pretty accurate, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, as to the pattern sequence, I think that Jeb Stewart did a wonderful job. And if you put pattern in a scene for only 30, 30 seconds or so, you're wasting a fantastic opportunity because a pattern is a huge character. He's way larger than life. And um, I, think he, I think he captured the tone of what really happened. The conversation is essentially was lengthened a great, a great deal. Um, but what pattern, said in essence to Sparks and what Sparks said to Patton is what Sparks actually told me happened, you know? So yeah, um, yeah, I mean, there were lots of, you know, where it really mattered that you didn't make things up, that you didn't take too much license, Jeb Stewart, Stewart didn't do that. He didn't make people do things that they actually didn't do that were, would make you feel really uncomfortable if you were cared about the truth, uh, the overall truth of the narrative. So, you know, the main difference between my book and the show is that there are three key characters that you focus on. Obviously, the star, Bradley James, plays Felix Sparks. But then there's a Mexican-American and then a Native American who are also very, you, very, you focus very much on them. Um, and that's not what happened in my book. I do mention Native Americans. There are a couple of instances where I talk about the large numbers of Mexican-Americans in the 157th. But... That was a very conscious decision that Netflix and, well, first of all, Jeb Stewart made and Netflix made, which they wanted to show a much more diverse face of World War II, of victory in World War II. They didn't want it to be a white knight, you know, crossing Europe. They, they wanted to show how diverse Sparks' unit really was, because it was. I mean, it was a very integrated and diverse unit, a lot of Native Americans, a lot of Mexican Americans, and. That, that was important to, to show that, to show that America didn't defeat Nazism and fascism with a bunch of white guys. It was a lot more complicated than that. So that was, that was great. I loved that decision. I think it really paid off. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't involved in the production, but when I looked at the production later on, I thought, wow, it's probably good that I wasn't involved because I might have made them think twice or I might have said, no, I don't, I don't like that. I'm not, uncomfortable with that. In fact, without going on too long, very, very early on, I said, because I've been involved with various people in Hollywood for quite a long time, I said, you know, from bitter experience, you don't want to listen to me anyway. You want to go and do exactly what you want to do. So best of luck. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. But I'm here whenever you need me. But otherwise, best of luck. Get on with it. You know, don't feel like you have to owe me a thing. You know, you, you create your vision from what you find in the book. Don't let me influence you too much because someone like Jeff Stewart, who's a very, you know, very, very, very good, experienced commercial writer, knows what he's doing. He doesn't need to be held back in any way by me. I've already written the book. That was, that it's there for him to do what he wants with. Yeah, I think that was one of the most surprising aspects of watching the the series was how they used Felix Sparks as the entrance point to talk about or to show those composite characters of the Native American and the Mexican American. So I was I was surprised by that. And also yeah. That, yeah, it was a way yeah. of highlighting a story that hasn't been told and that kind of and the dominant narrative of World War II. So yeah. I wanted to know how you felt about that because um, that was, yeah, pretty surprising. And so it seems like um, you also appreciated that. Um, so also um, this question came from Paul. And it does, it goes back to that um, question of, of, of the series being faithful to history. And um, Paul's question um, refers to, you know, writing about the other side, so the Germans and how Felix says, you know, uh, they were guys like us just doing their jobs. And we touched on that with Dan last week, that that's a common narrative with American veterans that those Germans were just doing their jobs, just like us. Um, and there's that part in, in the film, which was also in the book too, it's like, it's the part with the German, when the German soldiers choose not to shoot, you know, as far as, Boss, yeah. Every, yeah, they have every opportunity. <laughs> I was, I almost wanted to see a little bit more um, of why, you know, in your book, you, you tell why um, Boss decided, why the German soldiers decided not to, but in the series that kind of fell through. So I was just curious, again, going back to combine these two questions, um, how was that seen for you? Because that's a, a pretty pivotal point for Sparks's, you know, experience. He really laid his life out there. 
Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's a good, uh, good question. Um, you know, some people said that he should have received the Medal of Honor for what he did there. Um, he definitely put his life on the line um, to try and save some of his men. Um, I actually was put in touch with the guy, the machine gunner that you see in the Netflix show. There's a guy called, his alias is Voss. Um, and uh, he actually wrote a book called Black Edelweiss, which is a source for me. And through the 157th Infantry Regiment Association, I managed to, to via email, not by direct phone call, um, that wasn't allowed, um, by asking some questions of someone that belonged to the association, I actually received what looked to me like pretty authentic replies from Voss himself, from the guy that doesn't shoot sparks in the show, which at the time I was like, is this crazy? Is this real? This is a, this is a guy that was in the SS, you know, 70 years ago, he's actually emailing me answers to my questions back and forth. And I, you know, I, I have quite a few of his responses in the back of the book. So those of you who haven't read the book yet, please go out and buy at least 10 copies for yourself and your families for Christmas. But if you look in the back of the book, you'll see lots of Voss's answers to me. Coming back to your point, Voss didn't kill Sparks, as he told me, and as he told actually um, the Denver Post, I think, no, Rocky Mountain News, uh, quite a while ago, before it folded, he told them the same thing, that he, he couldn't have killed Sparks because you couldn't kill a man who was trying to save somebody else's life. It, 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 he wasn't threatening Voss at, at that time. And he was stunned by his bravery. You know, he said it was, I just couldn't pull the trigger on that kind of guy. It would have been, it would have been wrong. In my mind, it would have been wrong. So I believe him. You know, I'm, I, I don't know where Voss is today or I wasn't allowed to talk to him personally, etc. I don't know about, you know, his relations with various people, etc. But I will tell you this, when I asked him, if he regretted being a member of the SS, which was we, the, sorry, the Americans declared to be an illegal organization, illegal to belong to it, banned in Germany. You can't show the SS sign or anything to do with the SS anywhere in Germany. It's completely banned. Voss was a very proud member when I communicated with him of the SS. And he said that, you know, he denied that he knew anything about the Holocaust. Yeah, that's the, it's the standard answer. You know, I was just a good soldier. I was in the Waffen SS. I wasn't in a concentration camp. I wasn't murdering people. And I'm proud of the, my brotherhood in the SS. So here's a good German. He's a, he's a good German that didn't kill Sparks, and, but was still proud to be in that SS organization that ended up parts of the SS murdered millions of people. You know, so this, it gets very complex, you know. Sparks certainly didn't hate the Germans. Uh, there's a, a blog piece I've put on my website. It's the most recent one. If you go to alexkirschel.com, I actually put, an up, put up an interview with Sparks and he talks about why he didn't hate the Germans. And he talks about the SS. He talks about ordinary German people. And he concludes by saying, you know, the SS were pretty bad. I didn't, I didn't have a lot of time for them. German soldiers were fantastic. They were really good. German people had enormous sympathy for them. And he said, like you said, soldiers were just like us. They were doing the job. They were caught, trapped in a system. And then he said, but if I'd met Hitler, I would have cut his throat. And I don't know whether you ever met Rose. I don't know whether you ever met Sparks. Did you ever meet him? No, I never did. He's a guy when he says he's going to cut your throat, you take that seriously. If you wouldn't, that was chilling, you know? Because I can imagine him literally pulling out a knife and actually doing it with carefully, deliberately, you know, that, that was Sparks too, you know, he's a tough guy, the scary guy, the warrior, you know, he knew how to kill people. Yeah, that was interesting when he, because you have, um, in the book and in the series, it shows Felix saying, you know, they were just doing their jobs like us, and then during that Dachau scene, uh, I think it's uh, Walsh who says, one of the German soldiers says, we're, we're just like you. And he says, no, you're not. You're not just like us. So it shows that dichotomy, yeah. I thought yeah. the dichotomy of the different ways that the American soldiers are handling the, you know, their, their enemy, you know, what they were fighting. Yeah. 
and the, and also you know in the series we see there's a an, 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 a nod towards like the humanity right of the German soldiers um, yeah in this box. Um, yeah so let's see on to our next question here um, which actually goes to as you're talking about you know your talk to his boss how much of the reporting relied on interviews with family and soldiers um, so talk about your reporting technique and that comes from Jennifer, who's a journalist, so I'm not surprised by that question. <laughs> um, well, you know, the, the, the most important thing um, was to get to see and talk to as many people as possible. Obviously, Sparks. So, you know, I was very happy that I got to see him for a couple of days, an, an hour or two one day, and maybe an hour the next day. It was a lot of pain. You know, he died several months later. It was 2006. And... Uh, so that was very important because I couldn't, I couldn't in my, I couldn't live with myself if I'd actually written a book about Felix Sparks and not actually met him and, and interviewed him, asked some questions myself. So that was a, the book wouldn't have been possible without that, that foundation. And then obviously that takes me on to Dan and you guys and Dan did fantastic interviews with him and uh, you guys gave me the interviews and they were very, very important to my, to my book. You'll see in the notes. Regis University, Regis University, Regis University. And then I went to uh, a couple of reunions, three reunions of the regiment. And this was, you know, in the late, you know, 2007, 2008, 2010. And I interviewed everybody I possibly could. I interviewed people, whoever had served with Sparks, whoever was there. And you can see in the book, their voices come out. You know, you, you can, every now and again, I tried to, to, to put in a scene or two where there's somebody actually had served with Sparks that I actually talked to that described various things that happened. In fact, in the Netflix show, when you have the American soldier who's being interrogated by the German officer early on, I think it's in the Anzio section, um, that's actually based on an interview I did with a guy called Vinny Stigliani, who I met at a reunion and told me that story word for word. And some critics have said, what the hell is that? You know, like, why is he talking to a German? Why is he talking about bridges in Italian? Why is this SS officer there talking to this guy? That's kind of like, it's, what, what's the point of that? And I'm like, well, it's in the book, almost word for word. And Stigliani told me that word for word. So yeah, it was very important to interview as many people as possible, um, especially Sparks. And I, and I was able to do that, you know? Um, Voss, for example, that was, I was, uh, I was kind of happy that I had that because that was a big moment, Sparks being saved by the enemy by not being killed and to have that point of view was cool. It's really cool, you know? Yeah, I thought that scene with what you just talked about, the interrogation scene, they used it. I was fascinated to see that they did. It was almost exactly as your book with the conversation. Yeah. You. And yeah. then also they used it as an opportunity to say, to show, oh, well, you Americans are treating Mexican-Americans and Native Americans as second-class citizens, you know? Yeah. And how dare you? You know, so it's interesting how they use that piece from your interview, and then to make a larger, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, that was larger. great. Yeah. It was great because it's it comes up it comes up early in the show, and I and I sat there and I was like, oh my god, it's almost word from word for the book, and I'm like, wow, that's cool, you know. So and actually, the actor, the the guy that plays uh, Stigliani in the uh, in the Netflix show. Um, I, I posted on social media a picture of actual, the real Stigliani and then the actor. And um, the actor was very happy to see himself in the same, the same shot, you know? So it's kind of cool. There's all sorts of things like that, you know? Um, uh, one other example of that, one other thing that was really nice is Carl Mann, the guy I told you about, the translator for Sparks, who's still alive. Um, he had, his son took a photograph of him in front of a television, pointing to himself in the Netflix show. So you've got this old, this old, old guy with like sprouting white hair, and he's very proudly smiling and pointing to himself on a TV screen, saying, "Hey, that's me. I'm a, I'm on TV now." So yeah, that was cool. Mm -hmm. um, so our next question is: So Felix Sparks did not talk about this experience for thirty years. Did he tell you why he did not share that for so long? He didn't talk about what, sorry? Um, the question is that, um, says that Felix Sparks did not talk about his experience for almost 30 years. Um, did he mention why he didn't talk about his war experience before that? Uh, not to me, no. I mean, he didn't, I, didn't, I didn't ask him that. I, didn't, I wasn't aware that he, 
hadn't spoken for that long about his war experience, it doesn't surprise me. He, he really he really became active in the 1970s. He uh, they brought the um, uh, and then into the 80s they had a he he was the one that first organised a reunion of his regiment. Um, and um, then he became president of the Regimental Historical Society Association, or the Regimental Association rather. So he was very instrumental in bringing everybody back together. But um, he uh, he talked about it at great length, and he talked about what happened to him in the war, to him in the war at great length for a couple of reasons. One, he wanted the people to know what had happened, really, and number two, Dachau was a very important day in his life, and. He despised Holocaust deniers. He was very outspoken about racism, really um, very progressive in many ways, very open-minded, um, and really thought it was very important that he should speak out about what he'd seen at Dachau and why it was important for everybody to know that that had happened, that he'd been there, that what he'd seen had been so, so powerful, and to learn the lessons of from from that episode to so that he could impact future generations you know so yeah, yeah am i answering your question am i answering your questions okay or am i am i blagging on too long and no you're doing just yes. fine Alan. yeah I, uh, don't, don't think about it too much you're doing just fine oh. <laughs> um let's see uh um i actually just lost what i was gonna say um so we have a question here. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. Um, Dan did mention last last event that one of the reasons why Felix started talking more was because of that, those Holocaust deniers, because he wanted to know that he, he wanted, so he would speak at conferences and he just wanted to get yeah. the word. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons why he started to really speak about it. Um, so let's see. I have a uh, question here from Amber. So obviously work can be a very sensitive topic. Was it hard to get people to talk to you about their experiences, especially knowing that their stories might be published? Uh, no, no, because they know that I'm there to interview them for historical reasons. And I, I you know, with, with this book, I didn't have a problem with anybody talking to me. Um, um, quite the opposite. The, they, they were very, very keen in some cases to tell their story. Um, but you have to remember that's because they knew that I actually, you know, had published a few books that had been pretty successful, that I'd written a couple of New York Times bestsellers, so that, you know, it wasn't like only five people in academia were going to read this, you know. That's not that's not the point of what I do. I try and lead, reach as large an audience as possible. Um, and also, I think that um, they were within the environment of the Regimental Association, uh, so they were used to coming to these events and talking and sharing stories and having drinks with their buddies. And they were used, to, you know, if they didn't want to talk, they wouldn't be there. That's not, that's, you know, it was a social event, if you like. Um, but there were a couple of guys where it was just very powerful. I remember one guy that I interviewed in Denver, actually, at a reunion, um, just very, very, very powerful stories. Sometimes I would be in, in tears and they would just be talking, you know, and I'd be like, wow, you know? Um, so yeah, when I think back on it, you know, I, I went to a reunion in, in um, Asheville in 2010 and we, there were about 15 guys that lined up for a photograph. And I look back on it, at the time people were taking photographs and I look back on it now and I was like, it was just another event. It was just another evening with a, with a bunch of veterans from World War II. And now I look back on it and I think, wow, how special was that? How, how amazing was that? Um, one other example of that is that uh, one guy that Sparks knew really well was a guy called Van Barfoot, and he received the Medal of Honor. And I went to a reunion where I had to speak to the 157th, and Barfoot was sat right next to me. And I was like, this guy was a, a Native American. He was a true, real badass. I mean, really, really amazing warrior, brave, you know? And um, I remember thinking, wow, I'm sitting next to a guy that won the Medal of Honor serving with Sparks in World War II in Italy, you know, it's, it was kind of, it was kind of, it was, it was intense, intense, you know, and so few of them are left alive now, so few. They're all in the mid-90s, you know, or late-90s. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. Um, 
a good segue into our next question, which is, um, do you walk the battlefield with veterans or have you walked the battlefields in Europe with um, veterans? Yeah, I have, yeah, Normandy, yeah. Um, crossed Omaha Beach with a guy called Dan Farley, who was uh, a company of the Second Ranger Battalion. Um, that was a very powerful experience. He, he hadn't been back to Normandy since 1944 to actually walk across Omaha Beach where he lost so many, well, well, where so many Americans were killed, to actually be there with him walking across that beach on D-Day. 70 years, 60, I think it was 70 odd years later, was a was pretty powerful, you know? When you're actually there in the place where these guys fought, it's kind of, it's, it's very interesting, you know? I've done the same at Bastoin with a 17th Air, Airborne guy, with a 101st Airborne guy in, in Bastoin too. Um, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, it's intense, you know? Yeah, and that's how, actually how you start the book. Um, Felix in, isn't he in one of the battlefields? Yeah, he's, he's, he's touring, he's doing a kind of tour when he was retired of, of the battlefields and the cemeteries where I think there were two and a half thousand guys killed from his his regiment, you know, so he, he lost a lot of guys that he knew really well, you know, that, that he really loved, you know. Yeah, that's the thing with reading your book. I've read it a few times and each time I'm always reminded it's, it's, it's almost exhausting for me to read because of how much like grief and trauma and just like he just keeps trudging him and his company just keep like trudging through and there's so many losses that it's just how could one person take so much or how could you know so um, yeah, I just see that. How do you feel? Do you think that the Netflix series got that across? Just how long? Yeah. Or just, okay. Yeah, I think it does a really good job of that. Yeah, I think it does. Um, it it certainly made me feel a lot, you know. Um, so I think it does a really good job. Yeah, um, I think it shows how it shows that he was really profoundly affected by it. That he was heartbroken, you know, because he was. You know, he, he told me he never could recover from a lot of the things that happened in World War Two, losing so many men was something that he, he, you just don't get over that. You know, the survivor's guilt was enormous. The, the trauma he himself suffered, the PTSD that he lived with, the, the memories, the, just a lot, a lot, a lot of death and pain and, and, and suffering, you know? And you had to be very strong to survive and very lucky. And you had to be really quite tough um, in every way to, to, to live a, a long and full and very productive life afterwards. That's, I think, what I admired about him as much as what he did in combat was just how impactful he was afterwards, you know, that um, he didn't sit around and mope and groan and drink, drink himself to death. He was, he was um, a, a great, he did a lot with his life and he was very productive and very, very uh, impactful, you know, not just in the war, but after the war. For Colorado, especially, you know, I mean, He's a general, he was the general of the Colorado National Guard. He helped reform it after the war. The reason why you've got your own water supply basically is because of Felix Sparks, he preserved and conserved that, in the, that water supply for Coloradans. Um, he served on the Colorado Supreme Court uh, for a year as a justice. He was a big deal, you know, and he commanded the Colorado National Guard for over a decade. I mean, that's, that's not nothing, you know. So I think that he was not born in Colorado, that he moved to Colorado for romantic reasons. He moved, he moved to Colorado because his men told him how beautiful it was. And he's like, well, I want to, when I'm on the GI Bill, I've got to go back to college. I want to get a law degree. And he chose to go from Arizona, move with his young family to Denver, uh, Colorado, and get his law degree. And he stayed in Colorado after that. So, you know, most of his life in Colorado. Um, and drawn to it because of the men that had fought and died for him, fought and, and waxed lyrical about where they came from, which was, you know, E Company that he commanded. Sparks commanded E Company, the 157th Infantry Regiment of the Thunderbird 45th Division. And he took command in September of 1943. And that E Company came from Lamar, Colorado. I don't know whether anybody listening knows where Lamar, Colorado is. I'm sure people do. but. So a bunch of guys that had joined the National Guard in the 1930s were still in E Company under Sparks' command. 
And it was those guys that talked about their homes and their families and the mountains and Colorado that, that made Sparks think that sounds like a really beautiful place. So without going on too long, one of the things that I loved about Sparks, and I really loved my notion of him, that I put into the book. Um, I only met him briefly, scared the hell out of me in person. But I loved what he symbolized and I loved his humanity and I loved what he represented to me in my mind of a good person, of a, of a person that suffered and fought and endured a lot. And I take one example of why I really loved him was that he, when he came back after the war and he was in Colorado trying to finish his law degree, the governor of Colorado phoned him up and said, Sparks, Colonel Sparks, I need you to do me a favor. And Sparks said, what, whatever I can do. And he said, I need you to take six months off college, drop college for six months. Here's, here's a bit of money. I'll get you a car. I want you to drive all around Colorado, go to all the old small towns and mining towns and the, the villages all around Colorado. And I want you to help me put back together the National Guard. And Sparks said that when he was, he agreed to do this, didn't want to do it, but he agreed to do it. And when he was driving around Colorado, he would go to places where guys had come from that fought for him and where they, they came from places and fought for him, but they'd also died under his command. And in, I think it was Lamar, he went to a widow's home and he said that, you know, it really struck him for the first time what the war had really cost when two young boys came running out of that widow's kitchen. And he realized that the guy that he'd given a command to in World War II that had then died, had had two young boys. And then fast forward later on, he's sitting and drinking a coffee in the living room, looking at these two boys and he'd killed, he'd, he'd given the order that had killed their dad, you know? So that's a guy, he didn't need to do that. Didn't need to go back, didn't need to confront the consequences of his decisions and commands. Because if you command men at that level in combat, you end up killing a lot of them. They, they carry out your orders. They carry out what you tell them to do. And that often leads to them being killed and dead. And you have to live with that. You have to think to yourself, every day that you live and survive after a war, did I make the right decision? If I'd done it differently, if I'd had more sleep, if I hadn't made that mistake, if I'd done this, which families would now have a father? So that's what I also really admire about him, you know? He's just a kick-ass dude. He's a st st stud of American history, the total, unbelievably strong humanist, a fantastic man, a great, great man, really. Yeah, that's similar to what Dan was saying last week about how he asked Felix. Um, so the, just back up for a second is that Dan met Felix at a, um, a World War II um, celebration or parade downtown, and then he started coming to Stories from Wartime during those first few years. And since uh, Regis had developed a relationship with Felix, that's how Alex got to, got to yeah. Regis. Yep. Um, but Dan did say, like, what, what's your what, what's your final legacy of World War II? And Felix pulls out a letter from a mom um, whose son had died. So you can see that he carried that that he carried with him throughout his whole life. Like, it really comes down to that to the loss. And I do think the show did a good job of getting to getting at that. Um, yeah. So actually, it goes to our next question. So about maybe somebody who who knew Felix in particular. Um, the person's wondering if if you know if Felix Sparks knew uh, Captain Chester Kaplan of the Forty Fifth Division. Kaplan was one of the first through the gates of, at Dachau, and he spoke Yiddish and was able to help direct some supervision. Or maybe I'm sorry. The question is if you know that person. No, I don't. I've not not heard the name, but I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I you know. Um, I've not come across that name. Um, a lot of controversy about Dachau and, you know, I've got people trolling me right now from the 42nd Infantry Division that claim that they were there first and that, you know, Sparks, you know, exaggerated various things and whatever. It's been a, long, a lot of bad blood between the 45th and the 42nd because they were both there. And um, anyway, I don't want to get off track, but um, yeah, um, there were a lot of people there. Um, some people say they were there that weren't there. There's a syndrome known as Dachau syndrome, which is that, you know, half the US Army apparently was there on the 29th of April. Um, they weren't. But the, Dachau was a big, was a big uh, uh, 
a large complex. There was a concentration camp within a large SS complex. And then there were lots of sub camps. There were dozens of sub camps, smaller camps. So when people say that they were at Dachau, they very much could have been at a sub camp 20 miles away from Dachau, not actually Dachau, Dachau, but somewhere else, a, a camp somewhere else that was part of the same Dachau system. So that's how you could possibly have people say they were at Dachau and they weren't. Yeah, I mean, Felix, anyway. yeah, there's a photograph to prove it, which you know, it took a while to come out, but that you can say he was really there. And ultimately that one photo of him shooting up in the air helps yeah. him hear his name in those, um, in the killing of the SS officers. Um, so we just have a few more minutes left and I'm curious, I wanted to end it with, um, well, I guess you have a couple questions coming in, but I'll, I wanted to ask you this one. Um, so in your book and the acknowledgements, you do talk about the Center for the Study of War Experience at Regis and Dan and, and Nate Matlock, who helped you with the manuscript, I think. Um, I'm curious if there's anything about, um, you know, your interactions with the center and the, and the faculty um, that has shaped some of the ways you see war or, or if it was always a compliment, you know, with how you're writing about war is in alignment with, you know, with the center, um, our mission here at the center. So I'm just curious how your relationship with the center has shaped anything you've written or anything with the liberator or have you always found just a very mutual kind of alignment with the kind of perspective about war? Um, well, you know, I always found you guys to be incredibly warm and welcoming, uh, Dan, and a lot of fun, um, huge amount of fun. Uh, and Dan was very um, charming and friendly and easy um, to get along with and uh, made me feel very comfortable. And as a journalist, I've often not felt that in an academic environment. Um, there's a lot of uh, intellectual snobbery directed from academics towards people like me. Um, and I, Dan didn't show any of that. He was very respectful. He um, really appreciated what I was trying to do. And he, made, he gave me a lot of encouragement. Um, and I had lots of great long conversations with Dan, um, with you and others. Um, I loved the way that you brought veterans together with students. I thought that was really powerful and unique and very important. Um, I liked the way that, um, it, you set things up. It was always very exciting and atmospheric when I would be in a lecture hall and there'd be a front row of like, you know, or there'd be something, sometimes like, I remember in the early days, 20 or 30 World War II veterans would be there and it would that, it'd be a full house. I mean, there'd be like two or 300 people. Um, and there was a kind of excitement and electricity about that. Um, and it was really, I remember saying several times, it was really, it was uh, really moving and fun and powerful. And it was actually unique to be able to talk to students, the general public and World War II veterans themselves, all at the same time in the same audience to combine those groups of people was absolutely fantastic. Can't do it anymore because there's none of the World War II guys around, but you can certainly do it with Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam. And it's a very, it's a very good thing. Please keep doing it. People that are listening to this that have any money, give all the extra money that you possibly got to the center, to Rose and her new colleague, because what they do is very, very important. I benefited enormously from it, not just in terms of research and the relationships that I formed there, but also in terms of really seeing young people start to become fascinated in how you tell stories of trauma and conflict and war and uh, being exposed to those stories and having to grapple with them and deal with them and, and learn from them. Because this isn't just an academic exercise, it's about reaching into people's souls, uh, understanding their delicacies, how weak and frail and strong we all can be. And I think that, you know, the fact that I'll end with this on my, this particular part of the rant, but I am sick to death of Zoom. I'm sick to death of, fake technology that we all have to use, unfortunately, separating us, not being able to hug, touch, feel. I think we've all had way too much. And I would say this, that today, as I speak right now, more Americans have died this year from COVID than did in the whole of World War II. So in, in less than a year, we have seen more Americans die than did from Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941, 
to the 15th of August, 1945. So we are in the midst of epic tragedy. World War II was similar, but by talking about World War II, by talking about survivors, by talking about resilience and sacrifice and, uh, and humanity, we can realize that nothing really ever changes. We just, we're, we're all always going to be human and weak and flawed and beautiful. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and I'm glad that the, our audience here can listen. And yeah, we're just so thankful for our um, relationship that's been ongoing for a number of years now. So we look forward to seeing more of your things turn into Netflix series or Hollywood dramas. And you let us know if we can help at all. <laughs> yeah, I will. But I really, yeah, it's such a delight to be with you. So again, I wish if we were in a, an auditorium together, we could give you a big round of applause because you deserve it. Um, so yeah, thank you so, so very much. Um, and let's see, I do want to say one last thing that we have here is that um, we do have some bonus content for uh, the folks who um, are on the call here. We do have the, the signed copy, as I mentioned. And then also, we, I found um, some of the early appearances um, that Felix made at, at Regis in the, in the late 90s, I believe, 1999 and 2000. So they're actually posted online. So in the follow-up email that you'll get from the alumni office, there'll be links to those um, videos so you can actually watch Felix um, sharing his story. And I think it's really a wonderful opportunity to, again, read Alex's book. Um, he made a pitch for us that wasn't planned. And so I'm going to do an un <laughs> unplanned pitch for Alex. Go buy his books, um, but that way you can really hear Felix sharing his experiences, and then you can read about them and see how Alex portrayed it. And then you can also, you know, watch that Netflix series. So it's a really cool trifecta um, of how, like Alex said, how stories are told. Um, so again, Alex, thanks so much, and thanks for thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, yeah, and join us for stories some more time, and uh, just check out our website here in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have that schedule up. So thanks so much. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Bye.